twice. All right, we'll take your Bibles and go back to 1 Peter chapter 4, but we're going to get a little bit before uh, where we were this morning, uh, chapter 4, verses, verses 1 through 6. So we're at 1 Peter chapter 4, working our, our way through, uh, through 1 through 6. <coughs> wrap up Peter before too much longer and spend a little bit of time uh, with the judges. We had not spent enough time in the Old Testament, I think, uh, of late. And we're kind of missing part of what God has done by skipping, you know, 1,500 years of redemptive history. So we're going to go back and, and pick that up uh, and, and look at a couple things start, starting here in a few weeks. But I want us to hit some, make sure we get the things in, in 1 Peter that we really need to get. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting with, with verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent doing what the Gentiles choose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that though they, although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. And we're going to leave some of that along, you know, aside. Uh, the idea of the gospel preached to the dead. Uh, spends a lot of New Testament studies put folks uh, on their head because they're not really sure what that means. Um, does it mean the times past when the gospel was preached through the Old Testament? Does it mean something else entirely? We're not going to go there. Instead, we're going to start with this first part. Since Christ suffered in the flesh. What does it mean that Christ suffered in the flesh? Why does that matter? Well, to understand this, realize that none of the letters, none of the New Testament is written just out of nothing, okay? Peter doesn't sit down and say, you know, I haven't talked to anybody in 20 years, and I've been living life as a hermit out here in a cave, and before I go to my next Hermits United meeting, I want to write a letter about what I think. Peter has been out doing ministry. He's been out preaching the gospel. He's been out hearing people's opposition to the gospel. He's been interacting with churches. He's been interacting with individuals. He's dealt with people who want to claim that the gospel is not true, or with people who are warping what the text of Scripture has and what the apostolic witness, what he had seen, was about. And so when he says things like, since Christ suffered in the flesh, he's making a point to kind of push back against the thing that people push for. Now, we've got to use some big words tonight, and you need to... Uh, you don't have to be able to spell them because otherwise I'd put them up on the screen so that you can make sure you spell them right. But we need to pick up a couple of things because these matter. Because these keep cropping up. Okay? They'll turn up at Christmas. They'll turn up at Easter. CNN loves some of these things. They don't like the big words that go with them, but they like these ideas. And one of them is what we call, first of all, we, we call them heresies. Now, a heresy is a belief that claims to be right and based in Scripture, but is so wrong... That if you believe it, you go to that eternal hell instead of to that eternal heaven. Okay? That's a heresy. For a, her for some, for a false belief to be a heresy, it has to be so bad that it keeps you from believing the truth about Jesus. Heresies, very bad. There are also errors, things that are just wrong. And they won't keep you from going to heaven, but we think they keep you from following Jesus as well as you should. Okay? Some of those errors are very blatant. Some of them have to do with what we see as the differences between different kinds of churches. Okay? We believe, for example, as a Baptist church, we believe that the New Testament picture is that you baptize someone after they come to faith in Christ by taking them to water, putting them all the way under as a picture of burial, and lifting them out from the water. Okay? We are what's called credo-baptistic, or we believe in believer's baptism. We think that people who sprinkle babies are in error. Presbyterians can go to heaven, but we think that they're wrong before they get there. Okay? Because they didn't baptize the way we think Scripture teaches. That's an error. Guess what Presbyterians think about you? They think you're in error. They're going to see you, that, you're, that we'll get together in heaven, and they'll be able to say, 
Jesus told you you were wrong about that baptism thing, didn't he? We expect to tell them the same thing. But we expect to see each other up there. Okay? Uh, same thing with different methods of, of baptism. For example, some people baptize, some denominations they baptize, or they call it baptizing, by pouring, right? By sprinkling a little bit. This leads to the old joke about how do you bury a Methodist? You sprinkle a little dirt on top. You know, that's not, you know, it's an error. It's not a heresy. It's just an error. Okay, we get errors all the time. There are people who, you know, they put sugar in the cornbread and drink unsweet tea. No, sugar goes in the tea. Okay, those are errors. All right, work with me, folks. These are bad. Uh, so, but they, heresies are beliefs that cause you to believe something that is so untrue, and it replaces. Now, it's not the same as a false religion. Islam, for example, we would hold to be a false religion. But it doesn't pretend to be Christianity. So it's not a heresy. It's just a false religion. It's a completely different belief system. Okay? Hinduism, completely different religion. So they need Jesus or they're going to hell. But they don't think they've got Jesus. They don't think they need him. Heretics are people that think they've got Jesus and don't. Okay? So... The, the heresy, one of the things that, that crops up it, even in the first century of the church is a heresy that we call docetism. And that's a big word. It's not all that big of a word, actually. But it's D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Docetism. And it means appeared, or it refers to the idea of appearing. And what it means is this. People came to the belief that if Jesus is God, God can't die. So therefore, whoever it was that died on the cross only looked like he died. He didn't really die because God doesn't die. Except that the hinge point of the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins and rose up from the grave on the third day. And so if he didn't really die, he wasn't really resurrected, and you're not really saved. This is why docetism is a heresy. Because people believe that they're okay, because, well, no, Jesus is great. But it's not the case. This is what Peter is pushing back with. You see it in 1 John 2. He talks about Christ coming in the flesh. Paul talks about Jesus dying on the cross. There's a stress on it, and it is because there were people that were so convinced that it couldn't be that Jesus just appeared this. And so that's why we get this. He suffered in the flesh. Just like if I were to come down and you know, jab you with, you know, with, with, a, with a microphone stand, you know, it wouldn't just appear, it would hurt. Okay? It really hurt for Jesus to die on your sins. He, he wasn't faking that. And docetism leads to some other things and, and some other bad beliefs, but ultimately that's, that's where it starts, is the idea that it only appeared to be, it either, he only appeared to die, or it only appeared to be him, and somebody else died and died instead of him. Or he only appeared to have resurrected, and in fact he was really dead, and they were all just having this massive, oh, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus was alive? It's almost like I can see him right there. Oh, look, it's almost like I can see him right there. No, you really did see him right there if you were one of the apostles. Okay, that's what really happened. He was really right there. And so this is what Peter is stressing, and he's pushing back against that heresy, because if that slides into the church, then we stop believing that Jesus really died for our sins. So one of two things becomes the next step. We either believe that Jesus didn't need to die for our sins, and we're all going to be okay, which is not true. Or we start to believe that our sins aren't really atoned for, so we have to do works and earn our way back to God. Which is also not true. Because guess what you can never do? Earn your way back to God. It's like putting together a 10,000 piece puzzle and you're missing 50 of them. No matter how much work you do, it's never coming back together. Apart from Christ, it never goes back together. So that's what we've got to begin with is Peter's pushing back against that. Christ suffered in the flesh. In the body, the real physical body, God really put on flesh, really lived a sinless and perfect life, and really died for your sins. This is something that you need to know. You don't have to understand everything about it, but you've got to believe it. You've got to take that on faith that that's what happened, because if you don't, 
then you're missing what's crucial for you to have eternal life. Because this is what Jesus is talking about when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is what you're believing. And if you're not believing, you're perishing. No middle ground. A lot of times we think that there is. So he's pushing back against that. Then he goes on. There's already been enough time spent doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Carrying on an unrestrained behavior. I love the preacher speak. Unrestrained behavior. In case you've never noticed, preachers tend to talk around certain things, partly because we talk, we're talking to crowds, and we talked about this um, with the ministry team when we had lunch today. We were talking about you know, trying to deal with issues and how it's different when you teach children, you teach youth, you teach young adults. You know, you've got this spectrum of, of ages there, and while you're all teaching to the same point of what it is to follow Christ, what you teach an eight-year-old about how God created man Male and female, in the image of God, He created them. And that this is part of the grounds of why we have marriage. And it's a good thing for men and women to get married and have a happy life and, and to serve Christ by being married together and all of that. You teach 8-year-olds that. You teach 16-year-olds, you talk about it a little bit more in depth. And you also talk to the boys a little bit separately from the girls because you have some different things to talk about. And then when you get to the 21-year-olds... Then you have to start really dealing with a lot of the ways that our culture is pushing back, and you've got to do, deal with this with the 16-year-olds too, where our culture is trying to push back and say, actually, you know, boys and boys and girls and green, it's all just a big mess, and you get to decide if you're a boy or a girl, um, depending on how you feel this Tuesday. Um, and you've got to wrestle with that, but you deal with it differently. And so preachers, we tend to talk around it when we've got a big crowd. And Paul, Peter's doing the same thing here. Unrestrained behavior. And you can probably fill in the gaps about anything that would fit under that. Or you can go home and as you channel surf, if it's on the USA Network, it's probably unrestrained behavior. That's what you've got going on. If it's the, you know, the advertisements that you see for the unrestrained behavior. Where we do whatever comes into our mind, we just rock right on with it. By the way, never encourage people to follow their hearts because that's what unrestrained behavior is. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Don't follow your heart. Follow God's word. Yeah. Turns out a lot better that way. Otherwise, you end up with unrestrained behavior where you do whatever comes into your mind. You become, and this is, this is your next big word for the night, antinomian. Ooh, big word. But I'm going to try to spell that one because I can't read my own handwriting. Okay? But it's a word meaning against the law, against God's word, against having any restraints on your behavior. There are a lot of people that have that mindset that is because we've got God's grace, we can do whatever we want to do. I'm forgiven, so I'll just do anything. Now we're back to stealing a church van, wrecking it in the woods, and burning the woods down because everybody loves you anyway, and it's all okay. But you don't do that. Because it damages your relationship. Because it's the wrong thing to do. You don't do wrong just because, well, I'm, I'm okay with it. After all, I'm good friends with the governor. I can get a pardon. <laughs> I give $5 million to the president's campaign. I can get a federal pardon if I need one. I'll just do whatever I want to do. Jesus is going to forgive me anyway, right? Why don't I just go on? Because sin is still wrong. You can be forgiven of it. It doesn't make it right. In fact, if it was right, you wouldn't have to be forgiven for it. So, we, we have to watch. You need to watch for that. Be careful that. Peter's pushing back against Don't do that. Unrestrained behavior. Evil desires. That's right. Even stuff you don't do, just the stuff that you want can be evil and be sinful for wanting it. And a passing thought of, hmm, It'd be nice to have a have with us and such. It's not necessarily sinful, but when you start to dwell on it and it shakes your contentment in Christ, then it becomes an evil desire that you shouldn't have. It's one thing to have a passing thought of, well, I wonder what this would be like or that would be like. But when we start to dwell on it, it becomes an evil desire. Drunkenness! Nothing in life is ever made better by drunkenness. Okay? 
It just isn't. True. So, just don't. Orgies, yeah, we'll just move on quickly from that one, but that's a bad idea. An orgy is when you party to the point that your moral compass is not only is not only pointing in strange directions, it's completely broken down. And I would caution all of us to keep in mind that watching it for entertainment's sake, even watching people pretend to do it for entertainment's sake, is just as bad for your heart as participating. It may not be just as bad, but it's pretty close to it. It's still bad for your heart. You know, I said unrestrained behavior, you can go home tonight, click on your TV and find it. You can go home tonight, click on your TV and find this behavior. Some of you can find it on your DVRs and you need to go delete it. Because some of us are spending hundreds of dollars to have filth pumped into our homes every month by a satellite or cable. And we really ought to think twice about that. Evil desires, drunkenness, gorgeous, carousing. <clears throat> Go out carousing. Carousing is when you get carried away with it again. It has to do with just being unrestrained. The next thing is lawless idolatry. It's where you just go on and do whatever you want to do. Worship whatever God you want to worship. It's more than just a little unhealthy. It's destructive spiritually to you. But by the way, those who do that, you know, they're surprised when you don't join them in it. And he talks about it as the same flood of behavior. And then they slander you for it. The same people that tomorrow morning can barely stand to get out of bed to go to work because they're so hungover from a wild and crazy weekend. That's the same folks that Friday when you wouldn't go out drinking with them made fun of you for being a goody two-shoes for not going. The same folks that wonder, you know, that are constantly heartbroken because the latest boyfriend, the latest girlfriend ditched them again those are the ones who make fun of you for not having a boyfriend, not having a girlfriend. But they're also the ones who every other week it's a new batch of drama between them and their boyfriend, them and their girlfriend. See, they're seeing their own destruction, but instead of recognizing that it's a problem there, they slander you for not just jumping into it with them. It's the folks that call you a Freddy cat for not swimming in sewage when you really and truly, sewage is bad to swim in. And yet, that's what happens. I'm sorry, Jamie. I scared her earlier, and she's still scared of me. I didn't mean to scare her. She was going to fall down the stairs. So what do we take from this? First of all, realize that the Word of God is there for your own health and your own, for understanding what God's standards are. Somewhere around the world. 
there's suffering for your faith. But there's also suffering that's a little bit more personal and a little bit harder to, to mark. It's where you have to sacrifice. It's where you have to give up a little bit, where you have to you know, ignore some of the things that other people get to do or want to do. It's where you have to make a harder choice of following after Christ. But you need to be prepared for that and you need to understand that because if Jesus suffered for us so that we could be saved, we can suffer for Him, that other people will see Him in our lives. And other people will see that we have something to say and something that we believe in that's worth living our lives for. So that's my challenge for you this week. Take a look at the way that you live for Jesus. Spend some time investing in seeing what God has to say about who you are and what you're supposed to do. And maybe take a step back from the unrestrained behavior, the lawless idolatry. And realize that there is something very real about the effects of what you do in this world and what it does to you and your ability to follow Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We pray that you'll help us to follow well after Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll see y'all.